Well, warm welcome to this talk. It's uh, Saturday the 29th of January and it's uh, a windy day in the north of England. Now, I've got some serious things to talk about today uh, as regards the BA.2. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to have a little sort of light distraction because I've come in for the attention of an organisation called the... Um, what was it called again? I think it's called the BBC. I have heard of it before. Um, they've, uh, they've done a bit of a, a thing about me here. Apparently, I seem to have been saying various things. We'll have a look at it. But um, I've been, anyway, it's been labelled as false. Of course, I did not say 6,000 people had died from COVID. This is simply uh, laughable. And here is the uh, the BBC article. Of course, I'll put the... Uh, I put the website uh, uh, on. You can look at it di directly. That's actually quite interesting. Let's, let's have a look at it. Um, so, um, COVID posts claiming only 17,000 died of virus is factually incorrect. Uh, correct, that is factually incorrect, as I believe I've been saying uh, all the way through this pandemic. But of course, you'll have to decide that for, for yourselves. Um, so, reality check. Sounds good to me. We all want reality, don't we? So, reality is brilliant. Uh, then on the 20th of January, Dr. John Campbell, a retired nurse educator uh, who has amassed a huge following on YouTube. Well, it's kind of you to say so, BBC. I'll give that a tick. <laughs> Re released a video describing the figures as a huge story. Now, to be fair, I did say it's a huge, it is a huge story, and it, it is. Um, OK, looking back, I might have said a big story. But the point is... At the time I uh, published this video on the 20th of January, I saw no mention of this figure at all in any of the mainstream media. That, that probably just missed it. Um, if it's been in mainstream media, do, do inform me. I, I don't get everything. So, yeah, I did say it was a huge story because it is quite a big story because this, this is about human pain, suffering and death. And that's, that's why, that's, that's why we, we do what we do. Uh, and suggested COVID-19 deaths were much lower than the mainstream media seems to have been intimating. Well, um, did I suggest this? Let's just look at the data I actually used uh, in, this, in, in this video here. Uh, so here we have this data I used here. Uh, we'll do the survey later. Uh, coronavirus COVID-19 latest insights. So we used that data there from the... Um, oh, where's that from? Oh, that's right. Office for National Statistics. Uh, which, of course, is the most definitive source in the country by a long way, as everyone would admit, <laughs> we use the Office for National Statistics data. We also use this information here, deaths in the UK. Uh, this is from an organisation called, um, what's this one? Oh, yeah, UK Government. Uh, so that's from an organisation called the UK Government, where there's a lot of uh, official data as well. So we used, uh, we used that site as well. Uh, this is the actual freedom of information request, I think, that we were referring to, deaths from COVID-19, with no other underlying cause. We'll look, come back to that one in a minute. Uh, we use data from uh, this one. Uh, to be fair, we didn't use data from this. We used the, the, the extrapolation of the data from that, because that's actually the raw data sets. And, of course, great to see that the Office for National Statistics, rightly, is publishing the granular raw data and we noticed that this was a problem with um, certain uh, vaccines and therapeutics uh, as identified by the British Medical Journal yesterday. So full marks to the Office of National Statistics. Absolutely wonderful. And we've done nothing but sing their praises all the way through this pandemic, to be quite honest. They've been absolutely brilliant, which, of course, is why we use them. Uh, th th then we looked at this national life tables, life expectancy in the UK, 2018 to 2020. That is what we looked at. And then if we actually go on and look at some clips from the video itself. Um, where are they? They're here. It's clear that we put this well into context on the video. So there we clearly said 127,704 excess deaths above the five-year average. That's a screen clip from the video. And we did point out that many people think, and we clearly pointed this out, that many people think that this is the, uh, the best way to measure deaths, that th th these are 127,000 deaths above what would be expected for the five-year average. 
and we pointed that out in in some uh, in some detail with some emphasis it must be said on the video then we pointed out the uh, daily deaths at the time of course that's sadly slightly higher now uh, deaths within 28 days of a positive test again the UK government data from the site we've just looked at so we were quite clear at the time when we talked about this figure here and we put that into context so to say that I'm saying the deaths were only 17,000 is is not really quite what we were saying and then we had deaths within uh, 28 uh, de deaths on, where, where it's mentioned on the death certificates as a contributory factor as opposed to the 17 and a half thousand deaths or thereabout that we are talking about as being the sole the sole cause and uh, of course th this is the actual uh, data here that we need to see and uh, we'll have a quick look at this now. Uh, diabetes remained the most common pre-existing condition amongst COVID-19 deaths in England and Wales between October and December 2021. So this is the data we looked at. Uh, well, we, we, we've clarified, we didn't actually look at this data on the video, but we've clarified it many times before and since. Um, proportion of death certificates where the death was due to COVID-19 that had by top 10 the pre-existing conditions, the comorbidities. Now, I started talking about comorbidities and explaining this in January. Was it January? It was probably, late, probably early February 2020, when we started getting the very first data on comorbidities from China. That's how long we've been talking about this. I'm just full of incredulity here. That um, Anyway, uh, so diabetes receives the most common, uh, chronic low respiratory disease, high blood pressure, Diseases of the uh, urinary system, which would include renal disease, ischemic heart disease, where there's not enough blood supply to the myocardium of the heart, uh, signs and symptoms of ill-defined conditions. So this is other people with a, a variety. This could be called others, uh, long-term uh, causes of uh, chronic ill health. Dementia and Alzheimer's disease, heart failure and uh, complications and ill-defined heart disease where the heart rhythm is abnormal, cardiac arrhythmias, better called dysrhythmias, malignant neoplasm of lymphoid, hemopoietic and related tissues. In, in other words, that's basically um, basically people with uh, blood, blood cancers, malignant neoplasm of lymphoid, hemopoietic and uh, related tissues. They don't seem to have a separate category, category there actually for other malignant disease. Interestingly, presumably it's below the top 10. And then finally, the group we were talking about, COVID-19 cases with no pre-existing conditions. That group there, and as we said, that was about 17,500 or so from what it what remember. And uh, that is percentages, those terms of percentages. So we really couldn't have been clear on this channel about, about comorbidities. If I haven't made that clear, then I, I unconditionally apologise for being such a rubbish communicator. But that's that's always what we've tried to what we've tried to communicate. Now, um, and just out of interest, all that data is readily available here. Um, on, I think uh, yeah, that's live there. So you've got the hospitalisations. I mean, they've got fantastic, so accessible uh, levels of data from the Office of National Statistics, which is why we've used them repeatedly, absolutely repeatedly. So there we say antibody positivity, 98% in England. Anyway, we could stay there for ages because it's such interesting uh, data. And uh, I'll put the link there. Do explore it for yourself, of course. Don't take my word for it, as we've always said. So um, there's, a, there's a few links there. Um, click on them for yourselves. This was the actual... Um, Freedom of Information request data, which we did look at, of course, because that's what we were talking about. This is the the uh, the account that mainstream media hadn't picked up, um, to the best of my knowledge, um, at the time I made the video, which is what we were talking about. Um, so th th this is uh, 2020, where it was uh, the only known cause on the death certificate. Uh, that was the first quarter of 2021, January, February, March, April. Um, that was uh, second quarter, that was third quarter. And I think, I think the data might be just out for the fourth quarter now, because, we'll, so we'll look at that as soon as, as soon as we can. 
Uh, but we didn't have it there, it, we didn't have it on the original video, but you, you add those numbers up and you get the sort of figures that we were talking about where COVID-19 is the only identified cause on the death certificate. I mean, just to be completely clear, the people with diabetes and the people with heart disease would have carried on living for more years or decades. That's why we stress the excess deaths, the overall excess deaths, I believe is the most reliable indicator as we've stressed repeatedly on this channel. And, uh, you know, if you don't, if, if, if people don't think this is data driven, then please switch off now and go somewhere that is, because what we're trying to do is explain the evidence. That is, that is what we're trying to do. Um, now, the BBC did mention it's become a weapon. This disinformation has become a weapon of the cruel and heartless to dismiss the deaths of people we love. So that's a direct quote from the BBC uh, article. Um, now, the, the, the idea that I don't take death seriously is, uh, well, I, I, I've been sufficiently unfortunate, or indeed you could say immensely privileged um, since I was 18 years old. Uh, the first person I looked after who died when I was 18 years old. I remember, I'm not going to say their names, but I remember the three people concerned. Well, th th these things are, are branded and seared into, into your memory. Um, I remember their diagnoses. I remember their approximate age. I remember their faces. I remember their names. Um, when I was a first year student psychiatric nurse, I had these th three deaths, patients during my care. And, and uh, I, I've sat with patients many times as they've left this life by the bedside, by the, by the emergency trolley. On a, on a bamboo platform in a refugee camp. Um, the idea that I would take human death lightly or use it as a, and you, you get the message. I'm, I'm not gonna go on with that. Um, now, um, the BBC has contacted uh, Mr. Uh, Nazwaz, possibly, I don't know. Uh, Mr. Davis, I did actually talk to Mr. Davis this morning. David Davis, Member of Parliament, of course, uh, former Cabinet Minister. The BBC did, in fact, contact Mr Davis, but he was too busy to talk to them at the time. Now, unless there's someone out, another Dr Campbell, <laughs> it says the BBC has contacted me. Um, <clears throat> well, as far as I'm aware, they haven't. <laughs> it's not accurate. I have not been contacted by the BBC. I've been trying to contact the BBC for years. Well, at least for two years, <laughs> I've been trying to contact the BBC uh, to correct them on some points, to discuss some points, to clarify other points uh, without success. And I I've actually passed personal messages on to senior people in the BBC. And, and I know the messages got there because I trust the people that were delivering the messages and um, they've, never, they've never contacted me. Uh, my, my channels of communication are well and truly open. And to that end, <laughs> so Rachel, Rachel Shara, health, health and, health and disinformation reporter who wrote this. I've actually um, contacted Rachel this morning asking for an interview. So far from this information here that I've been contacted by the BBC, but I'm hiding in some sort of corner somewhere. No, I will come on the BBC anytime and uh, discuss these matters. And I'm very open to being interviewed. I would deeply like to be. So Rachel, please, I've sent you a message. Um, I won't say how I've sent the message, but you will get it for sure. You'll get it. It's just via an electronic medium. Please contact me and let's discuss this. Um, because well, I think we both want to fight disinformation, don't we? So, um, COVID-19, latest insights and deaths. That's the thing we looked at now. Now, no, I guarantee this is 100%. I, I, I'm, this is 100% coincidence. Before, before I saw the BBC had made that uh, comment about me, um, I had actually prepared this uh, from the, uh, the Pope. Information based on scientific facts is a human right. Uh, I got this from the New York Times last night. Um, so, uh, <laughs> I, I, honestly, I, this is not, this is pure coincidence. I had prepared this before. Uh, Pope Francis. To be properly informed, to be helped to understand situations based on scientific data and not fake news is a human right. You know, I remember when I was a student, uh, student teacher, I, I, there, there was um, there was there was Paulo Freire wrote a book called The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which was quite quite uh, quite influential at the time about the idea that 
um, people can be kept in uh, subservience via a pedagogical education approach, which is, well, if you know, you know what pedagogical means, most of you. It means sort of a, 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 a where, where I say, right, you lot sit down, shut up and learn from me. I'm the great teacher, which, of course, is exactly what we, we don't do. Uh, we take what, what's now called... Uh, I won't get digress into education. We contrasted it at the time with andragogy, which is the ad adult approach to education, which I hope, hope we're doing now. <laughs> I hope so. Um, so um, I, I agree with the Pope. I'm not a Catholic myself, but I agree completely uh, with, with Pope Francis there, and I think that's really quite a profound comment for, for the pontiff to make. Um, journalists and scientists should try to build bridges to those who need to hear scientific truths. Now, implicit in that statement there, and it delights me to hear this, is the Pope is um, not saying there's such a thing as scientific truth because it doesn't need to. It's just presupposed there's such a thing as scientific truth. And that's what we're trying to elucidate, the nature of reality. So um, pretty, pretty powerful words here from the Pope, really. Pope also lauded those who could uh, properly place individual facts in a broader picture. Um, which, of course, we, we would completely agree with. Facts need to be taken in context. By explaining the causes and circumstances of a given situation, which is what we try and do. We try and do. Um, our world in data has recently noted that 10 billion vaccine doses have been administered globally. Now, what is the population of the world now? I think it's 7.8 billion. So, um, you know, enough for one each plus a few to spare second doses. Now Professor Pai, epidemiologist and biostatistician McGill University, Montreal, um, has basically, uh, well the background to this is, this is again New York Times I've just been reading, um, <laughs> I have no financial interest in that journal, uh, that paper, it's just uh, what I've been reading the last couple of days. Uh, South Africa for example has set up a hub to begin developing mRNA vaccines where scientists are trying to reverse engineer the Moderna vaccine from scratch. Now that would take some doing from scratch. And the New York Times direct quote because the US drug makers won't share its technology. And uh, Dr. Pye likened this to reinventing the wheel while the car is on fire. And uh, let me just play you a clip from uh, Dr. McKester from, um, I'm sorry sir, I pronounced your name wrong. We'll just play a clip back my in, twice. The, in the one of the journals mm -hmm. uh, and they were saying that the micro variant mm -hmm. eh, is the vaccine that we failed to make yes in other words mm -hmm. everyone is getting it is getting it yes not having any serious illnesses mm -hmm. but it's boosting the it antibodies boosting. yes uh, to fight any other kind of what wow. COVID-19 so in other words wow. I think mm -hmm. in, the, in the one of the journals mm -hmm. Uh, and they were saying that the Omicron variant mm. eh, is... Omicron is the vaccine we failed to make. In interesting, interesting. So um, if there's limited amounts of pain, suffering and death in uh, poor populations, um, it's not so much because of clever science, but because of the fact that Omicron has come along and is much less pathogenic which is uh, incredibly good news for many poor income countries if delta had carried on there as we saw do watch the full clip of that video it was on just uh, just a couple of days ago on this channel um if delta had carried on there would be uh, many more multiples of deaths compared to what there there were so there you go that's what we're trying to do we're trying to get across accurate information i started doing that in the well into the last century on these things we used to make videos on those. Then we went on to these, these things. <laughs> You'll recognise these. Then we went on to these things. What's that one? Brain AMP, an introduction to the brain and the skull. <laughs> then, of course, we went on to YouTube. So what we are trying to do is, is reflect the nature of science. So any, anyway, if the BBC wants to uh, get hold of me, um, uh, then I've sent that message. Let, let's do so and let's... Uh, Let's collaborate. I'm not going to be so petty as to ask for an apology or anything like that. We need to go forward in this and, uh, like the Pope says, get good information in, bad information out. And uh, that's what we want to do. The nature, the nature of reality, if that's not too pretentious, but it's what I actually believe in. So there you go. And uh, 
thank you for watching. If I get a chance later today, we will be doing the uh, <laughs> what we actually intended to do today, which was the uh, the differences between BA2 and uh, BA1 Omicron variants, both Omicrons, of course. And the news is pretty good. The news is pretty good. So if we get a chance to do that, uh, we we will do it. Okay. Thank you for watching.